Hello, I'm Yanis Simonidis. Today we will begin a new cycle of programs titled Holy Cross Live, designed to introduce you to the basic teachings of Christian Orthodoxy. In the course of these programs we will be talking with clergy and lay theologians who currently teach at Hellenic College and the Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology. Both institutions are located on this beautiful campus in Brookline, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. Our topics will range from worship, the soul of orthodoxy, the art of the Orthodox Church, church and life issues, prayer and fasting, and today's program, Orthodoxy, an ancient faith for the modern world. Father Alexander Schmemann wrote about the Orthodox Church, the true Orthodox way of thought has always been historical, has always included the past, but has never been enslaved by it. The strength of the Church is not in the past, present or future, but in Christ. Our guests today are Reverend Dr. Theodor Stylianopoulos, Professor of New Testament, and Reverend Dr. George Papadimitriou, Director of the Campus Library and Associate Professor of Theology at the School. Father Papa Dimitriou, Father Stylianopoulos, welcome. It's a pleasure to see you again. Uh, Father Stylianopoulos, if I may start with you. Uh, our subject today, as we said, is, is an ancient faith for the modern world. Uh, how does orthodoxy, in your view, remain traditional in the modern world? Uh, Yanni, that's an interesting way of putting the issue. Uh, it's both uh, catchy, but it's also accurate and relevant. Uh, precisely, the Orthodox faith uh, has shown this gift of uh, communicating over the ages God's self-revelation in Christ. Uh, that quote from Father Schmemann, that it is Christ who is the power of the Church, and the good news of Christ, which the Church proclaims in every generation, while it has been very flexible uh, in its historical forms. Historically, it has ancient origins, mm -hmm. but in terms of its spiritual content, it's always relevant in every age, whether it be in ancient times, or medieval times, or modern times, or even postmodern times, as we <laughs> might say today. And I'm sure you will tell us all about yes. those particular periods. Uh, uh, let, us, let us then start where, uh, in, the, in, the, in the beginning. Father Papa Dimitriou, can you tell us about the, the apostolic times, uh, the tradition that we, uh, uh, as Orthodox, have inherited? Uh, Orthodox Christianity is rooted in the Christ event, as Father Stenopoulos uh, just mentioned, in the life of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. Uh, and yet the apostles continued this uh, life, uh, and especially in organizing the church in its worship, in its uh, government, and uh, every aspect of the church. Uh, in fact, uh, the Apostolic Council, uh, we are told in the Acts of the Apostles uh, uh, resolved its issues that uh, it had at that time. And the Apostles were the ones that uh, gathered the people together and they preached and witnessed the Gospel throughout the world at that time. And uh, they brought Christ to every culture and every uh, race and people of the time. Uh, and this, this same faith uh, continues to be present and relevant today. To the day, to the day. Father Stianopoulos, any other aspects of the apostolic yes, tradition? I think that I'd, you I'd like to uh, make this comment. Uh, sometimes historians make the distinction between the church as an organization and as a spiritual movement. Mm -hmm. And I think it's uh, quite apropos in that uh, Christianity in the first place did not conquer the ancient world because it had a wonderful organization. Because it began, but rather because it began as a spiritual movement. Mm -hmm. There was a, an explosion of spiritual renewal. Uh, the church 
is a spiritual renewal movement within Judaism. And Christians were convinced, not simply of the resurrection of Christ as a doctrine, but an experience that Christ is alive, that the Spirit of God was poured up, out upon the apostles and the early Christians, and they had this wonderful sense of possessing the truth, willing to die for it, and a sense of mission to, to bring Christ to the whole world. How is what you described, how is that apostolic tradition still alive, applied, and relevant? We claim as Orthodox that we experience that on a constant basis. Absolutely. And that's the part of the ancient faith that's always relevant, the spiritual content. So whether we are in the context of worship and doing the divine liturgy, celebrating the Lord's Supper, whether an Orthodox Christian is by his icon at home praying to Christ as, uh, as the Savior and Lord and Redeemer, uh, whether an Orthodox Christian in the name of Christ is helping the homeless. In all these situations, we live out a life in union with Christ and carry out his message of love and goodness wherever we are. So the spiritual content relates very much to the essence of the faith, although the forms may have changed historically over, mm -hmm. over the centuries, to be mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. uh, now, what about the next and correct me, please, a major milestone, let's say the, 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 the ecumenical councils from the, from the first one. Uh, um, how, how do, and, and then the, uh, the, of course, formulation of Christian doctrine through the councils, and then we have iconoclast crisis, which uh, uh, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about monasticism, conversion of the Slavs. Could you touch on those milestones of, our, of the development of the church and the faith and tell us how is it, are they still relevant? How are they still alive in our structure of our worship, in the structure of our faith? Uh, the church is, uh, Orthodox Church is conciliar church. We want to keep in mind the modern world, please let's not. That's forget. right, it's yes. conciliar church and it uh, tries to resolve its uh, issues of faith uh, by consensus and by uh, having a, a council. Uh, and this uh, beginning with the Apostolic Council I mentioned earlier and, and also uh, later on when it found itself divided in the Roman Empire in the fourth century uh, on the uh, issue of uh, uh, the first ecumenical council of Nicaea. And uh, this, the issue was if, is Christ uh, truly uh, the Holy Trinity, member of the Holy Trinity, the person, the second person of the Holy Trinity, or rather a, uh, uh, a creature of God's. Mm -hmm. So this was resolved by the calling a council of bishops throughout the world, uh, centered, uh, came to Nicaea, where they, they concluded and uh, they formulated the doctrine of uh, homotion, or rather the uh, Christ is of one essence with the Father. And uh, conciliatory. Concilia uh, so this was the way of uh, resolving the issue, uh, and this is very, very relevant for us today. Uh, Christ is uh, is not just a good person or a prophet or like uh, any other uh, type of uh, of uh, a human being, okay. uh, but he is the living, uh, the living Savior, the living God who uh, came to the world and he died and rose. Uh, for, for me and for you and for the whole world. And this is why it's so important for us to, to believe in Christ uh, and to live Christ in our life, uh, in the liturgy and the, in our daily life uh, as, as Orthodox Christians. Mm -hmm. We, correct me again if I'm wrong, uh, we call the Eastern Orthodox uh, Church, the Orthodox uh, faith, the, the Church of the Seven Councils. Is, is, is that, am I correct? One way, that, of one way of defining the church would be because its basic uh, doctrine and polity has been defined by those councils uh, so that uh, it's many of its institutions as well as its practices, for example, the fact that our bishops are celibate while our priests are married. There are some celibate priests, you know, that the priests have that option. Uh, but one of the councils, for example, uh, in 692, the so-called uh, true law con uh, council uh, set down the uh, rule that bishops should be uh, not married mm -hmm. but uh, celibate. Uh, so there are many moments of course in history uh, as you mentioned Yanni 
and perhaps one of the greatest ones, was its original transition from its Jewish environment in which the earliest Christians spoke Aramaic to come into the Greco-Roman world that used uh, Greek uh, in various forms of transmitting the gospel. And that was a tremendous transition. And it seems to me that in our age, we're struggling to be born into a new world as well. And part of the gift of orthodoxy, its ability to uh, uh, be able to accommodate and adjust to contemporary forms while retaining the essence of its faith in terms of its doctrine and its worship. I was going to ask something about the, 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 uh, the seven uh, councils, which as an example, so the, the determinations, the decisions, uh, the findings of those councils, we feel as Orthodox that we still adhere to as precisely as, as possible and still the form is adaptable not only in terms of the modern world but in its many in the many different countries and cultures that exist of course and here we should world. make a distinction of course between uh, the teaching of the church in terms of doctrine the truth for example father george was speaking about the holy trinity mm -hmm. the understanding of the person of christ the understanding of salvation those truths always remain the same mm -hmm. but in terms of practice and regulations of fasting or the various forms of the liturgy, those are subject to change from period to period. Naturally, we Orthodox especially revere tradition because that gives us a sense of continuity and cohesion and solidarity and permanence. But there are some things within the tradition that are changeable uh, precisely. Could you uh, one of them, for example, in, in our contemporary times, there is a discussion uh, among theologians and, and uh, uh, leaders of the church, the possibility of returning to the more ancient tradition of a married episcopacy. So we may have someday, and some of us hope soon, the possibility of uh, married bishops uh, because at that, uh, today the selection of bishops is taken from a small minority of celibate priests because as you know, over 90% of our priests are married. Uh, so you have a much larger pool from pool which to select your bishops. A similar issue, uh, uh, the, it is. It has been. Uh, I don't know if it has been established, but it has been discussed that the role of women in the early church was very basic. They were the deaconesses. There was a whole tradition, etc. Is this again something that that uh, because uh, things are changing, the role of women is changing in the modern world? Well, it is. Uh, it is a fact that a historical fact, in fact, uh, that until uh, the 12th century there were deaconesses in the church. Until and, the 12th century. Yes, in in uh, some areas, mm -hmm. uh, and so there were. Uh, uh, this was part of our tradition. Uh, for some reason, it fall it fell by the wayside, and uh, there are no women today active as in, mm -hmm. in the diaconate, uh, and uh, this is. Uh, uh, much talk today among theologians to return to this practice of uh, having uh, uh, women in the diaconate. And uh, there is uh, also discussion of the uh, ministry uh, of women in the church, uh, more active uh, participation. Yanni, you mentioned yeah. earlier the word monasticism and uh, we shouldn't yeah, complete There were two this, things I yeah, wanted to without, We shouldn't complete the program without saying a couple of things about monasticism because it's such a great tradition of yes. our church. Some of our uh, spiritual classics, uh, our understanding of spirituality, we owe so much to those men and women over the centuries who devoted their life to prayer. Uh, and one thing I want to say is that what a wonderful example it is to show us through their lives that the kingdom of God is worthy every sacrifice. Of course, they withdrew from the world, even physically, in order to devote themselves to prayer. But we know also in our own busy lives today, distracted as we are with many obligations, we recognize more and more that we need quiet times in solitude, in a holy time, in church, in worship, in our private moments, to have this communion with God. There's a wonderful statement in the Psalms, be still and know the Lord. And if we're running around with all these obligations, it's very hard to have a sense of communion with the holy, which is the soul of orthodoxy itself. So monasticism stands as a permanent witness to that inward life, the spiritual life 
that should motivate our actions and our attitudes to the world. Thank you for that, for that uh, uh, comment. Uh, similarly, I also mentioned iconoclasm, and we know that historical occurrence uh, where uh, the, the, the state and uh, certain uh, people turned against the, the practice at the time, 7th century, 8th century, uh, of, of uh, our, our worshipping um, uh, our icons, and, uh, um, and then of course it, it returned. Can you tell us a little bit about, either of you, about our tradition of, of, of our icons, and again, how relevant is it today? Uh, the Christian faith uh, being uh, rooted in, the, in Judaism, as Father Ted mentioned earlier, uh, in the beginning it struggled a great deal against uh, uh, images and uh, icons of mm -hmm. any kind uh, in fear of uh, idolatry. Mm -hmm. uh, however, in the 8th century, as was mentioned earlier, uh, the, the church came to grips with the, with the uh, understanding of images or icons uh, as, uh, as an understanding uh, of, uh, of how uh, reality is portrayed in this world, such as uh, the, the saints, the church itself, uh, the Christ uh, who, is, uh, who was incarnated. Uh, and uh, then uh, the, the vision was uh, the iconoclasts were against uh, images that uh, uh, could be interpreted, as, uh, in, right. interpreted as, uh, as idolatry. As idolatry. Uh, so, so the church came up with the, uh, with the formulation of the truth that uh, uh, the icons uh, really uh, venerated, uh, and uh, the, ven the veneration goes to the uh, image that is portrayed upon, rather than, uh, rather than the, image the image itself. itself. Right, right. Yeah, and so here we uh, still adhere to the uh, mosaic uh, tradition of uh, not worshiping images, uh, and at the same time having images as part of our uh, whole uh, church life as a way of, um, of coming to God, as a way of looking into the mm -hmm. kingdom of God, as, as, an, as a window to the kingdom of God, as someone said earlier uh, today. You, uh, both as teachers and as, uh, as priests, uh, how uh, do your, uh, uh, your students and, 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 uh, and the people, parishioners or otherwise, uh, that you are involved with, how do they describe uh, their very uh, uh, tactile, the very real experience of, of Orthodox worship in terms of, of uh, hymns, the, the architecture, the icons, etc. In this modern world, these traditions that go back 2,000 years, they're almost unchanged, are they still Alive? Are they still relevant? Do they have a meaning today you know, as, we, as we go into the third millennium? It might be helpful, Yanni, to consider the wider principle here that's involved in terms of the question of using art, music, architecture, uh, things with which we express and live out life, and to use those elements to live our faith. Human nature basically is both physical and spiritual. We have a body, we have a soul. Mm -hmm. And both in Judaism and in our church, uh, in the Orthodox Christian Church, uh, we utilize all these elements, including incense, uh, to celebrate our faith. And it seems to me that uh, today we've come to a new appreciation of the importance of the body and also the union between the spiritual and physical uh, aspects of human nature. Doctors tell us, for example, that most of our elements are psychosomatic. Uh, there's an integrity between the, in the human being between the spiritual and the physical. And therefore, uh, worship and the expression of the Christian life should contain both of those elements. Uh, and we notice uh, in the piety of our people that it helps them to pray if they have an icon or a place in their home with several icons to remember the saints or the apostles and especially uh, the mother of God, the Virgin Mary and the person of Christ himself. Uh, with respect to iconography, the basic theological foundation is the incarnation itself, namely that Christ became human. If the divine logos, 
the preexistent God took on human form, surely we can express him in terms of colors uh, and uh, uh, icons. Though, as Father George said, we do not worship the icons, we honor them, we venerate them. Uh, they worship going to Christ himself and not to the paint or the wood uh, as such. Now, <clears throat> recently, the recent centuries, uh, an in enormous amount of mass migration, immigration, has occurred. Uh, and uh, uh, by virtue of that, what used to be perceived as, as an Eastern Orthodox, as an Eastern tradition, you know, in Byzantium, in the Levant, in Russia, in, in Asia, in Africa, parts, certain parts of Europe, has now spread everywhere. Uh, has this old tradition that claims to go back all the way to 2,000 years ago uh, unchanged. Uh, did it have to change to fit all these different cultures? How is it surviving uh, uh, in, in this, in this uh, migration, in this diaspora, which uh, 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 may be uh, Patriarch Alexei, when he was here uh, in, uh, of, of Moscow uh, recently, he said, I don't see a diaspora in this country. I see the Orthodox faith rooted in the mainstream of American life. Sure. Can you yes, of tell me how? Uh, for us, tradition is a living tradition. So while it includes permanence and stability and continuity, it also necessarily includes change because life changes. So there are the essential things which remained unchanged and the way we live our faith may gain new creative. So you mentioned the word orthodox. Obviously, the fact that uh, orthodox Christians now may be found in Europe, uh, in Australia, in America, uh, the title Eastern Orthodox is not as appropriate mm -hmm. anymore. Right. Uh, so the title orthodox or, or orthodox Christians uh, is more appropriate because we are everywhere. Mm -hmm. And here, whether consciously or unconsciously, we enter into many changes, uh, some which are very practical, like the use of pews and the use of organs Organ music, in, in right. music. Uh, we are challenged by new issues. Uh, I think the women's movement today, for example, is challenging us to rethink our theology and to dig, dig more deeper into the foundational principles of Christianity and to understanding our baptism as uh, an event that uh, makes us all united uh, with Christ and that which unites us with Christ is much stronger than anything else that differentiates us. Even Father Stylianopoulos, this present moment, look where we are with cameras, lights, uh, this could conceivably be unthinkable a few That's years right. ago. Yes. Uh, we are doing it with reverence and we're doing it to, to enhance the ministry because the ministry now since the global village etc is not cannot be limited of course only in a particular locale so we need to do this to take this and 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 disseminate it but the very presence of these equipment in this place is is sure. And a slightly adjustment. humorous aspect is, as you can see, that I'm a little more traditional than Father George insofar as I have a beard, although that is <laughs> shaven partly. Uh, <coughs> and both of us are wearing clerical clothes that are not exactly traditional. Uh, I hope I didn't interrupt you. I just, uh, it, it, sure. it, it occurred to me. Yes, Father George. I was going to say that, uh, that the Orthodoxy Day is a global uh, must be uh, seen as, as, as global uh, reality rather than just an Eastern reality or Eastern yes. Orthodox. Uh, uh, the, uh, the the church uh, uh, is not uh, in diaspora, uh, and I, I agree very much with uh, Patriarch Alexei uh, because uh, when you, we talk about di diaspora, we mean uh, people in exile, and most of our people here in America do not feel that they're in exile. They feel very much at home. Uh, and uh, for that reason, I think uh, we are uh, part of the mainstream, and orthodoxy is a very much a part of, uh, of the American uh, way of life. Yet we're still in a period of transition. There are generations that feel very much within this culture. Uh, our children may be fourth generation mm -hmm. Greek Americans or Serbian Americans and Russian Americans, but they're also 
uh, older people who were born in Greece. So we live this creative tension, yes. but we're here to stay. Right. Uh, so we have this great challenge of how to witness to our faith, not simply in its ethnic mode, but as a universal faith, according to the statements of the councils that the Orthodox Church and the Orthodox faith is the one holy Catholic and apostolic church and to seek to present the fullness of Christian teaching and the, and the fullness of Christian ethics and the fullness of Christian worship in ways that are fully communicable to the contemporary generation. Uh, very aware that we're running out of time. I, I want to just take what you just said, uh, uh, the, creative, the, the term creative tension, uh, even within the dialogue between the different denominations that have been created within the body, within the one church, uh, um, I think uh, very much, and please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, very much uh, the, 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 the Orthodox Church is, sees this dialogue as, 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 a, as, as creative tension in a positive way, sees it as a challenge rather than as, as something to distance us uh, uh, from the other faiths, yes. from the other denominations. Uh, absolutely. Anyone who claims allegiance to Christ and faith in Christ must seek unity because he's the one that has prayed for unity and commanded us to be one. So though we have differences and recent events in the, in the life of the Orthodox Church here in the, in the United States uh, has shown the tensions here as well as international. Uh, and within, in the new lands in, of course, in Russia, of course, between the different course. faiths there. Uh, uh, yes, you have one minute, so yes, you have Well, I, I think that the uh, the, the church is always, and the people, Christianity is constantly in transition. Mm -hmm. In transition in the sense that we are pilgrims in this world. And for that reason, we must seek as pilgrims to find Christ. And finding Christ, uh, we must recognize other people live also in Christ. And, and this, is a, this is an important uh, realization for us to, to know that we are in Christ and reach out to others who are in Christ as well. And, and so we shouldn't isolate ourselves. We should reach out and, and be part of the, the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Father George. Thank you, Father Sirianopoulos. Uh, I was going to ask uh, uh, the last question, what is the future of, of, of Orthodoxy? But I think not only you answered it uh, at the end, but you've been answering it <laughs> throughout <laughs> this, this, this program. It's, it, it, you have made it uh, uh, relevant, very relevant, very alive, and very promising for the future. And I thank you very much. You've been watching Holy Cross Live. This is Yannis Simonidis for Illuminations. Thank you for joining us.